ABC September 25th, the rookie season premiere. Rosalind Dyer, a female serial killer. Hello, John. Rosalind. The trial is going to complicate all of our lives. Answers the call. Rosalind's trying to escape. We need to lock this building down. The rookie. People are going to die, and you won't be able to save them. Wait! What have you done? Season premiere September 25th. And don't miss the new series, The Rookie Feds, Tuesday, September 27th on ABC. Hey, what's up, folks? New affirmative murder a little later this week, but with October around the corner, I wanted to release an episode of our Patreon-exclusive show, Cultober, from last season, just to give people a little preview if they're unaware or have never heard of Cultober, because season two will be coming out in the next couple of weeks. Once again, there will be an episode later this week, so you get two pieces of content this week. But anyways, I hope you enjoy, and if you do, feel free to join our Patreon for some more exclusive content. We'd love to have you. All right, guys, enjoy the pod. A commandment is a divine directive. Many faiths have mapped out a path of righteousness with lists of decrees to live by. Follow these guiding principles and the fruits of paradise await you in the afterlife. At least that's what some believe. For a group in Uganda, what started as a mission to spread the word of these commandments ended in an inferno of biblical proportions. This story begins in 1932 when Joseph Kibuteri was born. He was raised and educated in local Ugandan Catholic institutions. And contemporaries say, Joseph clung tight to his faith in the belief that it would lead him and those around him down the path of righteousness. He went on to become a school teacher and ended up back at his own primary school, where he impressed his students with his devotion to his faith. A student of his, Matthias Agusha, Said of Joseph, he was a godly man. You could tell by his practice, from going to church to tending to the sick. Joseph's wealth and stature grew, as did his dedication to the church. He became a supervisor for the region's Catholic schools and founded a private Catholic school of his own. He married fellow teacher Teresa in 1960. She bore Mr. Kebuteri 16 children during their 40 years of marriage. And she claims they had no quarrels in their home. He was a peaceful and pious Catholic devoted to good works. According to Joseph Kibuteri's son, Juvenar Rugambwa, he grew up in a lovely home with a lovely family. But that all started to change drastically after three women approached him at a service one day in 1989. The three women, Kredonia Murende, a former sex worker turned Catholic nun, Ursula Komuhangi, and Angela Mugisha were already leaders of a Christian cult devoted to the Virgin Mary. The three women told Joseph that he had been anointed to help them spread the word of God. They described to him their communication with the Virgin Mary. Kibbutzeri himself, after being informed of this, also claimed to have received similar apparitions of Mary since 1984. By the account of Joseph Kibbutzeri's very large family, that meeting in 1989 was the start of a fateful chain of events that led to estrangement from their father and husband, his clash with the Roman Catholic Church, and his eventual excommunication. The merging of the two churches of the three women and Joseph Kibbutzeri was rocky from go. The women brought a following with them, and quickly there were some 200 or so devotees living on the Kibbutzeri family farm. Tensions grew between the family and the followers because according to Joseph's son, Juvenar, when the people came there, they started mistreating the family, saying Virgin Mary had told them to do things and to keep them without food and to punish them. Credonia seemed to have a direct line to Joseph. She began spreading word about his wife being unfaithful to God and a sinner, as well as his family, and he took these words to heart. Joseph's son fought back, at first on his own, but then later backed by his mother and his siblings against the people who he had said made him feel like a prisoner in his own home. The family was eventually victorious. In 1992, the cult and its leader packed up and left for Kanungu, a mountain town in the western region of Uganda. There, the movement settled on a piece of land owned by a senior member of the cult. Mr. Kibuteri never moved back, despite his family's invitations to do so. Money, which was provided by the followers who sold their homes and possessions when they joined, 
and other funds obtained by groups and individuals overseas was used to build a church, a small complex of houses, offices, and a school. In 1994, they were registered as a non-governmental organization. A boarding school was also licensed. This was, however, canceled in 1998 when the license was revoked by the government. The reasons were teachings contrary to the Constitution, breaches of public health regulations, and rumors of possible mistreatment of the children at the settlement. Now, one would think that these would be incredible red flags to government officials to step in and keep a close watch on this group but they weren't. There's speculation within the community as to why this was, bribery being at the top of the list. For very many local leaders and national leaders in this country, uh, the the churches and the state have a good relationship and uh, the state is not quick to interfere with the church. So there was a reluctance there was a sort of a reluctance to believe that a priest could be up to something funny. We are beginning to see that there was a level of, um, of uh, what's the word, complicity by some of the local leaders. It seems that some of them were seeing something wrong that needed investigation, but didn't move on to investigate because they were offered presents. Estimates of their number before the eventual demise varies between 235 to about 650 and possibly even as high as 1,000 members. MRTCG was able to pull this off because of the fact that several of their high-ranking members were highly educated and recognizable Catholic church figures. People flocked to them because they believed that these people represented the Word of God. Unbeknownst to those followers, most if not all of these high-ranking members had been excommunicated, but still wore their holy garments and carried themselves with pious and benevolent energy. Now, as I've already stated several times, this group loved the Ten Commandments. In fact, it played a vital role in the existence of the MRTCG. According to their view, the Ten Commandments needed to be restored to their original importance. The prominence of this Decalogue also led to peculiar behavior. Out of fear of breaking the commandment, Thou shalt not bear false witness against your neighbor. The members mostly used hand gestures and made up sign language to communicate with each other and existed free of spoken word almost exclusively. The members were said to avoid sex and discourage medical care. They participated in rituals similar to those practiced in monasteries, like nightly prayer and minimal lifestyles, free of earthly possessions. The complex in Kanungu was seen and referred to as Noah's Ark. Here, the second coming of Christ would occur. Those within would pass to the new world. The community was organized and controlled by 12 apostles, six men and six women. And perched over top of the 12 was Kibuteri, in a sort of holy caste system. The community was divided into three groups. The novices were the newest members. They had to wear black. The next group up were those who promised to follow the commandments. They wore green clothes. And the fully professed members were those willing to die in the ark. They wore green and white. Before any person could become a full member of the movement, they were required to read the document, A Timely Message from Heaven, The End of the Present Time, or have it read to them. Most members were former Catholics. Some were, however, from African-initiated churches also called African independent churches, and also from local spiritualist groups. Dominic Katari Babo claimed in the movement's publications that the group did not consider itself a new religious movement at all, but rather an action to revive what had been abandoned. Now, one of the big differentiators between classic Catholicism and MRTCG's very unique brand of Catholicism 2.0, other than the obvious standing of the Ten Commandments, were the apocalyptic beliefs espoused by the group. The movement expected the second coming to arrive shortly and bring a new world with it, a world designed exclusively for devout followers of the Ten Commandments. Now we're going to take a little side trip. I want you guys to follow me back to 1999. If you're cognizant of 1999, it feels weird to me that I have to say that, but for those of us who remember 1999, 
it was a terrifying time. But nobody really wanted to say anything, at least from my perspective. I remember from very early on in 1999 hearing about Y2K and how the world was going to end and planes were going to fall from the sky and people wouldn't have money anymore. And there were jokes made on TV shows and on the news and we all just kind of lived and existed with this elephant in the room. But I was terrified. I was seven years old. And on December 31st, 1999, for the first time in my life, my family attended what I later understood to be watch night at our church. And I say our church very loosely. We weren't a devout Christian family. We went to church on all the important holidays, went to church when our grandmother made us go, but we weren't Bible thumping Christians. So this felt incredibly strange to me to be standing in a church with some 100 plus people, all of us with candles in our hands in a dark room, praying. After that night, I've never been to a watch night again. We went home, watched the ball drop, and I went to bed that night thinking that when I woke up, the world was going to be different. But it wasn't. And that's where the problem started for Joseph Kibble Terry. Affirmative Murder is brought to you by The Sparked Podcast. 2020 created a moment of people asking big questions, especially about work. Should I stay? Should I go? Or the work from home option that turned into never stop working? These are some of the many questions that award-winning author and podcaster Jonathan Fields explores on the podcast Sparked, presented by LinkedIn. Every week on The Sparked Podcast, a listener shares what's going on in their work and life and then poses a question to Jonathan in The Sparked Brain Trust. Then, the Spark team dives in, sharing unique insights, resources, and strategies. And, while they may be speaking to one person's question, it's always incredibly helpful to so many others who have similar questions and want so much more from work and life. For me personally, I listened to an episode on how to focus on big decisions and decide what's next. Because as a pseudo-podcaster with a day job, I wanted to get perspective on when it's time to make the move. And Spark had some very insightful answers for me. So if you want more from your work and life, and who doesn't these days, you've got to check out the Sparked Podcast. Just look for Sparked with Jonathan Fields on your favorite podcast app today. See, suspicions arose when Joseph's prediction that the Virgin Mary would appear and take members to heaven on the 31st of December 1999 did not come true. Many members began to rebel against the leaders and ask for their donations back. This eventually led to March 17th being named as the day Mary Magdalene would return to Earth to save them all. On 14th, all members of that cult who were present paid their taxes. They even paid any debt they had with anybody and made, made good all mishaps that had happened between them and the local community. According to them, the world was supposed to end on 31st December 1999. It did not happen. But before that, they had told the members to sell their property and hand the proceeds to the head. So they continued extending the deadline, saying, no, the world will end tomorrow because there was an error somewhere in the counting of the days. They said, no, the world will end in March until when they agreed it would end on 17th March. During the night of March 15th, the members came together and slaughtered three bulls to eat and consumed 70 crates of soft drinks they had purchased to celebrate the building of a new church. They prayed all through the following night, and the next morning of the 17th, they met in their new church building. A little before 10 a.m., they were seen leaving the new church to enter the old church, which was used as a dining hall at the time. The windows were boarded up from the inside, and the doors were locked. Just after 10.30, an explosion was heard, and a fire quickly consumed the building. Joseph Kibwetere's compound is abandoned now to the ghosts of his victims, the 330 people who perished here when they were herded into a church and incinerated. Inside the classrooms are the lists of children who studied here and died here. He told his followers this place would be their Ark of Salvation and used radio broadcasts to attract converts drawn by his promises of heaven, but 
only for those faithful to God's commandments. I found most of these bodies, the, the burnt bodies, because they were burnt, some of them to ashes, and others, of course, all of them beyond recognition, but they were concentrations near the exits, near the doors, which implies there was some a bit of struggle to get out. But the entrances had been nailed and blocked. So there was no way. They must have suffered a terrible death. Virtually no one could be positively identified. At least 330 followers of the cult were engulfed in the secluded mountain church at Kanunga. Whether the Inferno was a mass suicide, which is the second largest after Jim Jones, who led 912 followers to their death in Guyana in 1978, or a mass murder is unclear. The Ugandan police lean to the latter theory, particularly since they unearthed 159 more bodies in the days and weeks following March 17th. Joseph Kibutera and his followers lived an orderly but isolated lifestyle here in this compound, so it was easy to believe the Inferno was an act of religious fanaticism. But when police came here and found six bodies stuffed inside this deep hole, they began to suspect something far more sinister. The six corpses found buried under a building in the compound was just the beginning. A week later, another 150 in a mass grave nearby, then 81, then 130. By the end of it all, 720 bodies had been recovered. With more properties belonging to the cult still to be excavated, no one knows how many more there may be. It appears that the cult leaders may have also engaged in murder and torture before the final massacre. In Kanungu, there are numerous wide and deep pits where dozens of bodies, thought to have been dumped over several years, were discovered. Because of the absolute destruction of the fire, Joseph Kibuteri was never confirmed to be amongst the victims in Kanungu. The search continued for many years after the fire, and rumors of other apostles who survived the fire ending up in European countries were spread, but also never confirmed. Besides her devotion, there are some things Teresa is sure of. That her husband is dead, that what happened was not his fault, and that judgment is coming. I'm not the judge, but for, for the action they did, or he did, I'm sure he's not in heaven. For that, I, I don't know. God is the only judge for what they did. But where do you think he would be? Mm -hmm. Maybe in here. The fifth commandment says, Thou shalt not kill even one person. Hmm? Imagine so many people whose life have been destroyed because of Kedenia, my husband, and those priests. So, as a person, I think they can't go to heaven. I don't know, but only God knows. This tragedy did not taint religious fanaticism in the region or the country. Uganda is one of the most religious countries on the planet, and also one of the poorest. People struggling just to survive. Desperation. Souls ripe for exploitation. There's a church on virtually every corner in Uganda. Prophets popping up every day with grandiose promises of miracles and salvation and prosperity all for simply that last dime in your pocket. Because you don't need it where I'm taking you. Many people run to false idols because they are convinced that they will bring them what they need. Whether it's salvation, money, love, or just hope. I personally believe the day that we find true hope as a society is when we recognize that God is within us. That we are God. Every moment of this life is a precious one. A gift that so many others have never received. And if we stop looking for salvation at the end of some road, I think that we'll find that salvation may be the road itself.
ABC September 25th, the rookie season premiere. Rosalind Dyer, a female serial killer. Hello, John. Rosalind. The trial is going to complicate all of our lives. Answers the call. Rosalind's trying to escape. We need to lock this building down. The Rookie. People are going to die, and you won't be able to save them. Wait! What have you done? Season premiere September 25th. And don't miss the new series, The Rookie Feds, Tuesday, September 27th on ABC.